We spread our wings on this episode of the Paw Report. This time of year, the birds are singing and returning to our backyards. But certain birds have certain needs. And on this episode, we'll talk about excellent habitats you can create at home to attract a variety of species. So stay with us. Oka Vet Clinic in Tuscola and Dr. Sally Foot remind you to properly take care of your pets and are happy to help support the Paw Report on WEIU. Oka Vet Clinic located at 140 West Sale Street in downtown Tuscola. More information available at okavetclinic.com. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Paw Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. And welcome to the program today. I'm your host, Kelly Runyon, and joining me for this episode of The Paw Report is Dakota Radford, and she's an educator over at the Douglas Hart Nature Center, and she's going to talk to us about all things wild birds, specifically uh, setting up a birdhouse and what house is the best uh, thing for you at your house. So thank you so much for joining us on this episode. Well, thank you for having me, Kelly. Yeah, yeah. Birds is a topic very near and dear to my heart, so I'm happy to be Aww. here. <laughs> well, tell us about yourself and maybe a little nugget about the Douglas Hart Nature Center if somebody out there is watching and said, sure. I didn't know that there was a nature center around here. Well, I grew up in Northern Illinois and was very influenced by my grandma's love of nature and of birds. And from an early age, was looking out the window and, and really paying attention to what I was seeing out there. But it wasn't until I completed my environmental science degree here at EIU, actually, mm -hmm. that I was able to develop this a little bit more professionally. And out at the Douglas Hart Nature Center, birding is a huge deal to us. So it's really been a wonderful opportunity for me to work on those skills and improve a lot. Mm -hmm. We have some massive windows for looking out at our bird feeders. We have seen over, there have been over 180 different species of birds identified on the Douglas Hart property. So we see a lot of activity out there and every year I'm adding new species to my <laughs> life list, ones I've never seen before and learning more about how to attract them. And the center's located in Mattoon, correct? That's right, just on the edge of Mattoon, we like to think of ourselves as a little island among the cornfields, and I think <laughs> a lot of wildlife does view it that way, a great place to stop, to rest, refuel, get your basic needs provided for before continuing on on your journey. Yeah, well, mm -hmm. lots of people love birds. They love setting up habitats in their yards. So we're gonna jump right into it. You know, now is the time when birds are nesting. They're trying to find, in fact, I went out my front door the other day and a, a nest was being built right above my front door. But That's some true. birds are picky on where they put their nests. Let's talk about that, places to put Yes. housing. You'll find that birds are not always going to build a nest where you were hoping they were going to build a <laughs> nest. Um, morning doves in particular are so famous for their sort of poor nest choices, putting them somewhere awkward like in a gutter or in a um, animal cage or something that you plan to move later. And some birds don't actually build a nest off the ground at all. We had a nest here in Mattoon with uh, killdeer eggs in it on the playground at a local oh. school. So this little nest actually is built in the gravel or in the rocks and is very susceptible to being stepped on. Sure. Um, but excellent camouflage with the eggs there. Mm -hmm. As far as nests that you're likely to find around your home, um, some birds are very difficult to attract to nest in this area. I think the orchard oriole is a great goal. If you wanna shoot high, the orchard oriole makes an incredibly ornate woven nest that hangs from a branch. And occasionally we can convince an oriole to nest right here in this region. Most of them, however, will be motivated to go on a little further north. So you know if you see an oriole nest in your yard, you're doing something right. Mm. Well, let's talk about, you mentioned the oriole. That leads right into my next question about all the different species. You know, chickadees and hummingbirds and cardinals, I th blue, blue jays, those are the oh, yes. typical robins. But, but you said that there was 180 
that you've identified here in central Illinois, probably more. That's right. We're actually in an incredible zone for wildlife watching, including bird watching. Uh, we're sort of in that ecotone where north meets south. So we're lucky enough to get all the northern species of birds and have the pleasure of the visits from all the southern species of birds, making this a really ideal place to bird watch. Mm -hmm. We have right now a lot of birds that are migrating on their journey north for the spring and summer, or when they come back in the fall to head down south to stay warm all winter. And as those birds are migrating through, they're going on such an incredible journey, thousands of miles sometimes out of a tiny body, and so these restover places that we can provide by putting food and housing out are really important to them. And mm -hmm. when you start to notice those birds coming through, that's a great wake up call that it's, it's time to start thinking about your birds for the year. <laughs> Get your yard ready because they what, have a lot of What are the needs. most common around here? If you could sure. name just a handful that probably everybody will see on a daily basis. Yes, some of the best ones to learn first, ones that are easy to learn and easy to watch out for, would include the Northern Cardinal. So everyone sort of recognizes this bright red bird. I have a lot of kids who know him even from the baseball team. Uh-huh, my um, team. <laughs> Northern Cardinal, a re really easy one to attract to your yard. He's a very friendly house bird. But a lot of people don't recognize the female Northern Cardinal, who's a little bit more brown. And so she's easily overlooked. But if, if you notice any bird with that mohawk on top mm -hmm. of the head, you can be sure you're getting a visit from a cardinal. Some of our other um, neighborhood friends that are likely to visit in town, out of town, anywhere you can provide food for them would include birds like a blue jay or the itty bitty friend chickadee. I think this is always a favorite among people. He's a very personable bird and very friendly. In fact, if you're willing to spend some time outside sitting still and holding bird food in your hand, you can coax chickadees to rest on your fingers and eat the food. That's how mm. amicable they really are. Wow. So they're a fun one to see. Now are certain species like the cardinals, the chickadee, the blue jay, are they pretty picky on where they would, you know, where they like to take up housing? Some of our species, those three are not particularly picky, but they will be looking for our bigger birds like the cardinal or the blue jay are looking for a bigger space. So those two birds are typically not birds that we provide uh, constructed housing for. They're going to be looking for something in a tree where they have plenty of space to move around. After all, their wingspan is quite wide to be moving in and out of a little birdhouse. Some of our smaller species though, like the wren, the finch, or the, um, the bluebird are excellent candidates for providing housing in your yard for. These little birds know that they're small and they need protection from the big world around them. So a little enclosed area is just what they're looking for to raise their young. And those are the birds you'll most want to target with the choices you make in selecting your bird houses for your yard. Let's get into that, how about that? So yes. what should we consider when deciding what type of species that we want to attract as far as the bird houses are concerned? A lot of people will consider the rarity of the bird. So some birds are more in need of our support and our assistance. And the Eastern Bluebird is a great example of that, a beautiful bird that we are seeing decline in the wild. So if we can provide housing for a bluebird, it really is fulfilling a lot of our goals. This is a typical bluebird house, and he actually does require, he and she, require a pretty specific house to be satisfied with. This house is gonna have a very specific one and a half inch size entrance and a little bit deeper of a nesting area than you might see in some other models. Mm -hmm. These houses need to be out away from your own house and kind of in an open area if that's possible where the bluebird is going to feel safe. Mm -hmm. Some of our smaller birds though aren't that picky. If you're looking for a more general option. <laughs> and I can help you. Anything you point to just yeah, let me know. Our little tiny house over there, that's right, is a very cute option and, and this gets into just all the different things out there. There's so many different materials and construction designs that you can use. Mm -hmm. And this house is very petite with a small hole. And for a small bird like a wren, this is the perfect choice. They know that they 
are not going to have predators coming through that little doorway. Mm -hmm. And it's a nice um, enclosed kind of protected area for the young fledglings to grow up until they're old enough to leave the nest. Got it. Other okay. options might be a little bit more general. Okay. Um, that little wooden box on the very corner okay. or on the edge is a great one to share because this box is a pretty basic size hole, basic size of box. A large number of birds can use this one. So this isn't targeting any one species. This is a bit more of a generalist option. And you could have different, you could even have a sparrow end up nesting in here. A great thing when you're shopping for these boxes though is to consider the ability to clean them out. And that does not come with a lot of bird houses. Mm -hmm. Now that's not to say you can't use those at all, but if there's an option to open the birdhouse, you're going to have more control over the sanitation you're providing for those birds. So it's just one more way that you can really help them out by providing a little extra care. Mm -hmm. What about this? Uh, this is more of a feeder then. We'll that get to one that is and... a feeder, but if I could share sure, one more birdhouse. Yeah, we'll go to feeders in just a little bit. This one's just beautiful and, and you've just got to love, this is a ceramic style. So again, you're really not limited to any one single material or design. If you want to go with something a little more fun, mm -hmm. decorated, something that pops or matches your decor, you certainly can. Just kind of try to empathize with that bird and think about their needs raising a family. One thing that concerns me about this model is that really large entrance door. And as a mother bird, I don't know if I would feel safe mm -hmm. with such a big door. So this could discourage some small birds from wanting to nest here. Mm -hmm. But trial and error is really <laughs> an okay way to go as if well. You, if you could keep holding this, I wanted yeah. to ask you something. Uh, when I was doing some research on birds and bird feeders, one of the things that I read was the perch, that you should be careful about getting birdhouses with perch because that's a platform for prey. That's a, that's a great point. It's a really great way for a predator to be at your front door, knocking right. on the door, even if you have a very small entrance that's gonna restrict their entrance into your house, they're still able to maybe stick their head in, a sharp beak or a talon. Um, and so the less sort of landing pad you can provide on a birdhouse, the better. Birds are very talented at jumping right in there. <laughs> it's incredible to watch. You'll get some good entertainment. Uh. And that way, no unwanted visitors are showing up at their door. Dakota, you briefly mentioned, um, you know, ceramic, wood. Are there any things you should stay away from? Because sometimes when I go to the store, I see some really elaborate birdhouses that may look better inside your house than outside. Is there some things that maybe we should avoid? Sure, well, there's nothing intrinsically wrong about a decorated fun house. If it appeals to you, that's not gonna be a problem for the bird. They will really ignore a lot of those details and choose the house based on its merits on the inside where it's not decorated. So that's again where you wanna think about things like the size of the entrance, the size of the nesting space relative to the type of bird you're trying to attract and um, aspects of being able to open it up to clean it or even having some kind of airflow. Many models will come with some air vents towards the bottom or the top, which just helps healthy air keep circulating for the young. So thinking like a parent bird would be my <laughs> best recommendation as you shop for these houses. Where should we put them? <laughs> Should we That's put them a great on our question. porch and trees on our decks? Where should they go? Well, you know, I've got to say, you've got to put them somewhere where you can see it from your window because that's really important to a lot of us to be able to follow along with the story of these birds who are raising their families right outside our homes. That being said, you want to look for a location that again is protected from predators. And that may mean it's not too close to any ledges or other jumping off points. Mm -hmm. Cats, of course, a, a big enemy of birds um, and, a, and a constant presence <laughs> in our neighborhoods. And so if your birdhouse is located somewhere that a cat could leap from your fence onto, from a windowsill onto, or even from other trees and bushes onto, that's gonna put your bird family at a greater risk. 
The best option would be to look for a tree limb that's quite long so that you can hang the house, suspend it out away from any other landing points. Mm -hmm. And you may want to look for an area that it's, it's almost a little bit hidden from the wind. As I say that you want to suspend it down, you don't want to create that wishy-washy effect of flying in the wind for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. um, posts are a good option too. If you don't have a great tree with long branches, put a post in your yard away from the house in a separate area if you can and put the birdhouse at the top of that post. When is the best time to put them out? Is there a seasonal rule uh, sure. for that? A lot of our birds start arriving as early as late February, especially in the recent years. We've seen some warm springs starting off early. So you want to beat the rush, provide that housing that will attract them. If a bird doesn't see good housing options, it will migrate on and not stay to wait for you mm -hmm. to make your choice. So you want to have that house out and available to catch the bird's attention. Um, I would go ahead and put those birdhouses out in February. It's not even harmful to leave them out year round so that you don't run the risk of forgetting to get it out on time. Those birds will abandon the birdhouses through the fall and through the winter when they aren't nesting. Even when it's really cold, they don't actually use the birdhouses to stay warm. It's only for raising the young. So throughout the spring, it could be in use. And the important thing is not to take it down too early. Many birds will have multiple broods of eggs throughout the summer. As long as the season is warm and there's plentiful food, they'll continue raising their families. Dakota, do we need to help them along as far as putting nesting material in birdhouses or do we just say, you're on your own guys, you can, you can take care of it? It's wonderful if you can put some nesting materials out. And the best thing about nesting materials is they're often free items that we are just repurposing. So it can be anything from pet hair that you brush out to bits of yarn that you cut up with the kids, um, any fun material. Sometimes it is fun to use a bright color or a shiny material so that we can see it being used. But it would be better to make that material available outside of the birdhouse and let the birds make their own decisions as to what materials they select and bring into the house. Every species of birds has a little bit different preferences for how they're going to build that nest. Mm -hmm. Certain birds want a very soft feather lined interior to the nest while others prefer little blades of grass and things like that to line it. Mm -hmm. So they'll be really good at making those decisions. Um, you can lay materials out on a, on a um, bush or just out in the grass if you want the birds to pick them up that way. But if you want a more um, organized look for your yard, you can find some sort of little hanging feeder. This one's actually probably sold to hold peanuts or corn in, mm -hmm. but you can also put nesting materials in here. Mm. And the birds will be able to land on it and pull, pull those out. out as they want. So that's a really fun option, especially if you're able to see it from your window. Sure. Again, you'll have great entertainment. You mentioned cleaning. Um, there is some care in this. How often should we clean them? And what, I mean, are we taking the whole nest out or just all the food and, and whatever they've collected in their houses? It's, it's a good idea to not disturb the birds during the nesting season. From spring through the end of summer, we really don't want to be peeking in there too often. There are some bluebird monitoring projects because we're concerned about their numbers, which involve you in counting the eggs and counting the success rate of the young. But in general, we want to leave those birds alone while they're raising mm -hmm. their young. However, at the end of the season or before the spring comes again, it is a good idea to get in there and clean up. Just like humans, birds can get messy as they're raising all those young ones. And we don't want to have mold, bacteria, or any sicknesses lingering in our birdhouses. So again, if you can find a model that opens up, that'll be really helpful. You take and the you, whole can nest take, out? you can take all the materials out actually, mm -hmm. and the next bird will rebuild in there. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you'll even notice if, if it's been a few years since you've cleaned out your birdhouse, you may open it up and find it is packed to the top, I which actually <laughs> limits the ability of the next bird to use that space. 
So it's not a bad thing to reset for the year. Yeah. yeah. Well, we've talked about housing for our friends, but there's we also need to feed them. And you brought along some feeders and maybe some advice on what we should feed them. That's right. They are going to want to house near a good food source, of course. So feeding the birds is really the best um, place to start. And there's a lot of options if you mm -hmm. go to the store on mm -hmm. bird feeders. So I'm just going to give um, some basic advice here. We've got a really big feeder here on the end. We call that a house feeder. It's a house style, kind of that pitched roof. And this feeder would need to be mounted off the ground, maybe at the top of a post or some come with hanging attachments for a tree. Mm -hmm. This feeder is very accessible to all different kinds of birds. Almost any species is gonna be capable of landing on it mm -hmm. and selecting food from the dish below it, mm -hmm. which is great if you want a one-stop shop. Right. However. And, and <laughs> a lot of birds, however. Yes, not every, uh, bird enthusiast wants any bird to come to their yard. Some birds are considered more of a pest, like a grackle, a starling, or even blackbirds. Now, beauty is in the eye of the beholder, <laughs> so we can really accept and love all of our bird visitors. Mm -hmm. But if you're feeling like some of those birds are maybe bullying smaller birds away, or taking more than their fair share from your feeder, there are some options to open up more space for the little guys, which are usually the species we want to see. Mm -hmm. This feeder right here is what we generally recommend for songbirds. If you're trying to attract the little songbirds, they're usually very colorful. A feeder like this is just called a tube feeder is going to um, work very well for a number of different birds that are small. Anything larger than Chickadees. about three inches tall is just not gonna feel comfortable on this tiny ledge reaching into these tiny little entrances here. So this is gonna keep grackles and starlings um, from, from accessing the food. But chickadees, like you said, finches, cardinals, everybody else is still going to be able to co-mingle here right. and enjoy what you're feeding. And lastly, we're, we're about out of time, Dakota, the hummingbird feeder. A lot of folks want to oh, know what yes. you put it, sugar water. Yes, yes. The hummingbirds are a real treat around here, especially at this time of year. They're out in full force and every birder or window enthusiast is going to want to attract hummingbirds. We've got a fairly large example of a feeder there on the table, but I think the most important thing to keep in mind when feeding hummingbirds is less food is more. That sugar water out in the hot sun, like our summers, can go bad very quickly. And so if you provide a whole liter of sugar water, they simply won't be able to finish it before it goes bad. Mm -hmm. The best way to remember that is to just add a little bit of time less and is replace more. it more regularly, that's right. We have just one species of hummingbird here in Illinois, it's the ruby-throated hummingbird. But don't let their tiny size <laughs> fool you. These guys are quite aggressive and um, you'll often see quite a few quarrels among the hummingbirds oh, trying to get to your feeder. Trying to get to the sugar water. That's right. Well, Dakota, it was such a pleasure talking you, to you today. Very knowledgeable information Thank on you, wild Kelly. bird feeders. And I hope somebody out there might say, wow, that's some great information. I'm going to put a bird feeder out today. I hope they will. I think they will be shocked by just how many species you can attract to your yard very easily. Well, thank you. If you're a veterinarian, trainer, groomer, specialist, rescue organization, or shelter that would like to partner with the PAW Report by providing expert guests for the show, please contact us by emailing weiu at weiu.net or call 217-581-5956. If you have a topic you'd like to see on the show or questions for our experts, contact us with those too. It was a close call for an Oregon dog. His owners thought they had to euthanize him until they discovered a small problem on his neck. Nora Hart reports in this Paw Report Extra. When his mobility was just shot, like and he was paralyzed. It's just weird seeing him just laying there on the floor, but knowing that 
I felt like he had so much more life in him. That's when Feline Fate knew it could be the end for her beloved Ollie. And he's just been a really big part of our family. After a thorough check at the vet and no answers, they had to make a tough decision. Finally decided, you know, that they had reached their limit and that it was time to, to help him pass. Couldn't stand, he couldn't walk, couldn't urinate, couldn't defecate. Um, and so they actually had instructions to go get his bladder emptied um, twice a day from the regular vet to see if he would improve. Dr. Adam Stone treated Ollie at Dove Lewis Animal Hospital and said the dog's sudden onset of paralysis could have stemmed from a number of issues. Anything from cancer to trauma, a fracture of a, of a vertebrae or a, a spinal fracture, any one of these things could have caused similar signs. But it wasn't any of those things. The actual culprit was literally much smaller. Right here, yeah. Is right here, so right behind his ear. A tick lodged behind Ollie's ear. They think he picked it up on a recent camping trip, and it was discovered just in the nick of time by a veterinary intern. And it was in the room, like about to get, you know, put to sleep, and like it was just pure grace that it, the people like found something and decided to just check it out further. Aside from an unflattering haircut, he just seems, you know. A little bit different with his haircut. Ollie was back to his energetic self about 10 hours after the tick was pulled out. The next morning, my mom opened the door and she said, look at your doggy. And he comes walking up to me right next to my face. I'm just barely awake and um, he's just smiling at me. Well, that's our show for this week. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time right here on the Paw Report. Dave's Decorating Center is a proud supporter of the Power Report on WEIU. Dave's Decorating Center features the Mohawk Smart Strand Silk Forever Clean Carpet. Dave's Decorating Center, authorized Mohawk Color Center in Charleston. Okaw Vet Clinic in Tuscola and Dr. Sally Foote remind you to properly take care of your pets and are happy to help support the Paw Report on WEIU. Okaw Vet Clinic located at 140 West Sale Street in downtown Tuscola. More information available at okawvetclinic.com.